Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. I'd like to thank the Village Green and the Cultural Affairs Committee for setting up this event for us. I'm Galen Saroyan, and I'll be talking today about our historic Village Green mural that you see up here above us. Village Green, originally called Baldwin Hills Village, was designed to be a new kind of middle-class, urban, residential community spread over 68 acres. The project was overseen by Reginald Johnson, a Southern California architect previously known for designing residences for the very wealthy, as well as such buildings as the Biltmore Hotel in Santa Barbara, the main post office in Santa Barbara, and the Hale Observatory, which along with Village Green is now a National Historic Landmark. And I should also mention here that Johnson designed several churches, because that will tie in with what we'll be touching on. The consulting architect was Clarence S. Stein, the most formidable urban planner of the day, working here on his first middle-class development on the West Coast. Baldwin Hills Village officially opened by an ironic twist of fate on December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day. Originally, this community was all rentals. The room we're in now was the rental office in what was called the administration building. As you know, a quote-unquote normal rental office is usually comprised of a desk, a couple of chairs for waiting, an attractive paint color, and maybe some nice pictures on the walls. In this room, there was indeed a large, modern-style desk which curved out here into the room. There were several stylish chairs and there were some framed pictures on the wall. But something new is also going on here. It was designed to be a showcase of the principles of the Garden City movement. These principles held that innovative modern community design could and should work to bring order and balance to people's lives, which had become fragmented in the chaotic rush to profit that the supremacy of the machine and commercialism had imposed on the quality of life as the Industrial Revolution spread. It was Stein, inspired by the English Garden City movement, who had become the leading advocate for these principles in the United States. By the time it was completed, Stein wrote in his book Towards New Towns for America, he considered Village Green to be the fullest expression of these ideas. This mural was an important element in this showcase. It illustrated the problems and possibilities which drove the architects. Its message prepared you to enter a place, a space, where the experience of living would be different from what you'd known up until now. Here, we're looking at a photographic image, digitally printed on fabric, of the mural. This image was taken from a black and white still photograph from a series of early publicity shots and has been blown up to the actual size of the mural. The mural itself is under the fabric but is covered over by a layer of stucco. It was Reginald Johnson who personally commissioned and paid for the mural which he envisioned in this most public of the spaces at the village would provide an illuminating focal point. The mural was painted here in 1941 by the Italian-American figurative artist Rico Lebrun. You'll notice it's signed and dated in the lower right-hand corner. While what we see here on the fabric are sepia tones, we know that the colors of the actual mural are soft greens, blues, grays, and browns all in the dusty tones of a quote-unquote faux fresco. We know this from a color film of the room taken by Reginald Johnson himself in the 1940s. This palette echoes the landscape colors outside this room, where a silvery green olive tree allee and distant gray-brown hills and blue skies were more visible at the time than they are now. 
The only vibrant color note in the composition was the dusty coral-colored tassel on the main athletic figure's flying apparatus up there on the right. This bright touch of coral paint was in turn echoed in the color of the wide, low beds of ivy geranium that were planted immediately outside the full-length windows, flanking the entrance path to the community. The parallel in the colors here between the mural and the actual landscape is an initial example of how design decisions were organized to tie disparate elements together. The resulting harmony was one of the tools used in fostering a calming mood that ideally would encourage a cohesive community. The title of the mural remains a mystery, but on a fundamental level, the scene does embody the overarching theme of the artist's whole career, which was metamorphosis. Enrico Lebrun's own words, quote, taking that which was disfigured and making it into what is transfigured, unquote. In his aesthetic, art was a force containing all the inconsistency, drama, and inner conflict of the human animal. From archives of his letters in the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art at the Huntington Library in Pasadena, we have access to his own words on various subjects, from which I'll be quoting. We should remember that this project was conceived and executed during the social cataclysm of the Great Depression. Lebrun once wrote, quote, We open square windows and rooms to look out upon the world. My windows are shaped by the irregular tectonics of dream and pain, unquote. The whole panorama here in the mural would seem a direct echo of these words from the hooded figure on the left looking through the window of a ruin at the unfolding drama to the earthbound suffering group struggling with their pain on one side and the questing muscular figures taking flight into a mysterious distance on the other. Rico Lebrun was born in 1900 in Naples, Italy. He received classical European academic training at the Naples Academy of Fine Art and also studied fresco painting from the ages of 18 to 22. But he said that his real artistic awakening came from the life he experienced in Naples itself, which he once described as, quote-unquote, the Baroque impulse incarnate. He said of his Neapolitan neighbors, quote, adamant about trifles to the point of revenge, they considered the major and serious aspects of honor as being negligible nonsense, unquote. And here he describes an instance of transformation that shaped the thematic hallmark of his art. Quote, the most memorable thing about the town had to do with the people themselves. Once a year, for instance, they gathered in the Cathedral of San Gennaro. They gathered to witness the miracle of the liquefaction of the blood of the saint. This event was a shocking and impressive one. From early in the morning in the vast church, jammed with human beings, the intercessors prayed and begged to his name that the miracle would take place. The petrified blood, which was displayed in a flask, was believed to liquefy as a sign of benevolence and protection from the patron saint. Failures in the past were always related to following earthquakes and disasters. The chorus of invocations increased steadily, and to be at this time in the midst of this latent explosion was a frightening and awesome thing. When the miracle happened, it was like being on the inside of a clanging bell. This collective and fierce will convinced that it could change the inert into the alive has never to me been a lost lesson. The miracle was in them. The dead matter gave way to faith triumphant, which goes for painting also." Unquote. After completing his formal artistic education, in his early 20s, Lebrun went to work as a designer and supervisor in a stained glass factory in Italy. After a few years, at the age of 24, 
he was sent by the firm to open a branch in the United States, in Springfield, Illinois. Lebrun, however, soon gravitated to New York City, where he quickly became one of the most successful commercial artists of his day, doing advertising illustrations for Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and The New Yorker, among others. Then in the 30s, which were his own 30s, he turned his energy and attention full-time to drawing and painting. In 1930, in 1933, he went back to Italy for further studies in fresco technique and returned to the United States to paint his first mural at the Fogg Art Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was during this same period that he began teaching, which was to become a lifelong practice. He started at the Art Students League in New York City as an instructor in life drawing, anatomy, and mural composition. This quote from his writing might contain something of his approach as a teacher. Quote, Against a full flank, the pulley, the jackknife of the arm, and the fork of the hand are held in a net of cobalt arteries. The palm is the folding well. Opening it is the measuring, webbed star for all uses from brandishing a spoon to consoling the lover. Consider the eye in the vault of the socket, the anchored planet. Concede two days of labor to fashioning the conch of the ear. It is the trumpet for incoming sound." Unquote. He quickly became known as an inspirational teacher, profoundly influencing his students including the young Leonard Baskin. In 1934, Lebrun applied for a Guggenheim grant and based on the drawings he submitted, was awarded the first of three that he would receive in his lifetime. He painted his next mural, titled River Flood, in 1936 for New York's post office annex at Penn Station. Then in 1938, Lebrun moved west to Southern California. For two years, he was artist in residence at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And it may have been in Santa Barbara, where Reginald Johnson had many connections, that the two met for the first time. During this same period, Lebrun taught at the Chouinard Institute of Art in Los Angeles. It was in 1940, in a famous episode, that Lebrun, working for Disney Studios, guided the animators of the classic film Bambi as they studied the anatomy of a deer working at one point directly from an animal carcass, racing against time as it decayed. It was a year later, in 1941, that Lebrun, commissioned by Johnson, came to this room to paint the mural we see here. With America still weathering the Great Depression, we see here that Lebrun, in addition to the influence of the Renaissance muralists, also found inspiration in Goya's engagement with the social and political tragedies of his day, as well as from the way William Blake blended spiritual and physical power in his work. We should also note here the influence of cinematography on Lebrun's art. For instance, the way the night or stormy sky at the top of the mural unfolds gradually into sunlight. As a cinematographer might position the camera, Lebrun aligned the viewer's point of view with that of the figures in the mural, focusing our attention with theirs on the horizon. And of course we have on the left that mysterious figure looking through an aperture into the wider scene as we might look at a scene unfolding on a film screen. Since we don't know the actual title of the mural, we might look for clues in the Los Angeles scene at the time it was painted. In 1931, during the bleakest days of the Great Depression, the perpetually optimistic voters of the Los Angeles area approved the expenditure of an extraordinary $220 million to bring water and cheap electrical power from the Hoover Dam in Colorado to supply the anticipated needs of the LA Basin. In 1938, the year Lebrun himself came to Southern California, 
the main aqueduct was completed, and in 1941, the year he painted this mural, it began, among much fanfare, distributing water to various participating communities, setting in motion the enormous and fast-paced population migration that had been anticipated. It seems likely that this engineering feat is echoed in the aqueduct bridge structure in the mural landscape, along with the dramatic migration of population symbolized by the winged figures. Perhaps also referenced by the winged figures in our mural is the following. In the mid-1930s, the Los Angeles aircraft industry had only just begun. But by 1940, 33,000 workers were employed by it. And in 1941, just one year later, the numbers had quadrupled to 120,000. The first commercial transatlantic air service had only begun in 1939. That same year, the first freeway in America, the Arroyo Seco, in nearby Pasadena, opened. So, quote-unquote, travel was in the air, as our winged figures here are taking off. The most influential architectural and social critic of the day, Lewis Mumford, declared airplanes and garden cities to be the two most important developments of the 20th century. The social awareness embodied in Roosevelt's New Deal resulted in 1940 in the first social security check being mailed out in one of the efforts to alleviate some of the suffering perhaps illustrated in the figures on the left in our mural. Modern technologies changing the possibilities, dramatic population shifts, the rise of social conscience, speed, and flight. These were currents pulsing through the environment when this Italian humanist conceived this mural. Equally important to Lebrun at this time were some of the revolutionary currents in the art world. In the 20s and 30s, the mural format gained wide recognition as one of the most important modern art forms. This was largely due to the powerful work of the three Mexican artists, Orozco, Siqueiros, and Rivera, contemporaries of Lebrun, all of whom, like Lebrun, had traveled to Europe in the 20s and 30s to study Italian Renaissance murals. They all returned to do work in both Mexico and the United States. These mural artists felt that the heroic scale and public venue characteristic of the mural facilitated their effort to make art an instrument of social renewal. Through their work, the muralists of the day came to be viewed as artistic heroes. Their influential style used simplified modeling and dramatic muscular groupings, as we see Lebrun doing here. Their subject matter, like his here, often described the utopia of a better world, while at the same time boldly displaying images of the suffering of the downtrodden. In the 30s, Siqueiros painted an outdoor mural in the courtyard of the Chenard Art Institute, which Lebrun himself would have seen when he came to teach there just a few years later. Another important element is the attention paid by each of these artists to how a mural fits into its environment, a contribution only now beginning to be widely recognized. In addition to the harmonious interplay of color with the landscape, we see how Lebrun has given thought to how the mural is positioned within the room. The scene wraps around onto the adjoining walls, inviting the viewer more closely into it. Also, at the time it was painted, the outlying hills seen through the windows, more clearly visible in the 40s than today, are an echo of those in the mural. The mural itself could be understood as a secular humanist altarpiece, dramatically occupying the place of honor in this light-filled, quote-unquote, green cathedral. All puns intended. One can easily imagine the soft, green-painted wall area above the tactile brown cork lining the lower area of the walls 
as having been designed to evoke an abstraction of a leafy allee of trees. The brown cork, quote-unquote, trunks below, and the green boughs rising above, with light from the ribbed glass clear story windows, not only helping to illuminate the mural, but piercing through the green like light through treetops. The floor of the room was inlaid with the geometric pattern of interlocking rectangles of four different colors of brown linoleum, evoking a light dappled path between the rows of quote-unquote trees. At the same time, the mural would serve, in effect, as the vista at the end of an allee, drawing you out into the broader, living landscape beyond. In this reading, the collaboration in the scheme of this room between Johnson and Lebrun could be seen as an unusual high-concept example of that signature modern impulse to blur the boundaries between inside and outside, while also ingeniously playing the real and the depicted off of each other. It was probably while Lebrun was painting this mural at Village Green that he fell in love with Reginald Johnson's daughter, Constance, an exceptional young woman, 20 years, his junior. Several years later, they married, and he adopted her six-year-old son, who is actually the person we have to thank for the 1940s color film A Village Green, taken by his grandfather, Johnson. They lived for years here at Village Green, near what is called the West Green, in Court 11, in Unit 55. To five. From their letters, we can get a wonderful glimpse into their daily lives. At the end of a 12-hour day in his studio, and these were usually part of a seven-day work week, he would return home utterly exhausted. But then, entering the kitchen to cook, he would suddenly spring to life, improvising a fabulous meal for family and friends. His recipes were legendary and wine, talk, and laughter would flow for hours. In 1960, Lebrun was elected to the National Institute of Arts and Letters. That same year, he threw himself into painting a major mural. It was to be his last, titled Genesis, at Pomona College in Claremont, California. This mural is positioned kitty-corner to a mural by Orozco, from the 30s, titled Prometheus. After his far too early death in 1964, a major retrospective of Lebrun's work was held at the L.A. County Museum of Art in 1967. Lebrun's work is held in the collections of the L.A. County Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the de Young Museum in San Francisco among others, and in many private collections. So, after exploring how the artist's beliefs, life, and times intersect, perhaps we can even see in this mural something of a metaphorical self-portrait, a depiction of the artist's own flight from his native culture of the old world on out into a brave new world. Thank you very much.